Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Blessed Podcast, where we join Jesus, where he is already at work, where we live, learn, work, and play. At Love KC, we believe that every person should hear the good news of Jesus from a friend. If that's going to happen, it will take all of us. The letters B L E S S in the Bless Podcast stand for Begin with Prayer, Listen to God and to those around you, Eat Together, Serve, and Share. Share your story and share his story. As always, we have free resources to help you live on mission at our website, lovekc.net, and there you can find upcoming events. We interview a wide range of people on the Blessed Podcast, well-known authors, speakers, and leaders, plus everyday people, because we want you to meet those you might not get to meet on your own, and we want you to be able to identify with someone a lot like you. Our podcast drops the 15th and 30th of the month. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share. Now let's jump into this episode of the Blessed Podcast with your host, Gary Kendall, and co-host Samantha Ling Krebs. Well, welcome to the Blessed Pod. Welcome to the Blessed Podcast, where we join Jesus, where He's already at work, where we live, learn, work, and play. And the purpose of this podcast is to encourage everyday people like you and me to know that we're called by God, you were gifted. And we each have a mission. And when we find that mission, it's fulfilling. There's nothing better in life. And so we tell stories regularly about people who have found their calling, people who are living on mission, and hopes that that'll inspire all of us to do the same. So welcome. If you're uh, on the Love KC Facebook group, Living on Mission, we're glad that you're here. A lot of you listen through Apple or you listen through Google Play or perhaps on YouTube, but however you got here, we encourage you to subscribe so that when these come out, you get them automatically in the future. And then of course, uh, share what you're experiencing with others. So welcome, we're glad you're here. Uh, Greg Greg Topping from United in Crisis, so glad that you're here today, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this. And Jasmine Villa, thank you for your, your support here. Jasmine's kind of filling in for Samantha Ling Krebs, who had a baby recently, and Jasmine, you're you're doing better than filling in. You're you're acing the exam. Wow! Thank you. So glad to be back. Glad to be here. Great. Well, we look forward to this time. So the way that we do this, Greg, is we just we just talk through things that uh, if we were sitting in a coffee shop might come up. And our hope is that as people listen in on our conversation here, the three of us, that uh, they get inspired and uh, either they participate in something that you're doing or something that Love KC is doing or whatever God puts on their heart. And uh, we just want to see them flourish and uh, go be fruitful. So, Greg, tell us a little bit about your story and and uh, how did you get to United in, in Crisis? Well, thanks, Gary. Um, I was I was working in Washington State. I was actually from Washington State doing ministry. I used to own a lumber mill. Like I've been a businessman a big chunk of my life. And uh, the Lord called me to move out here 11 years ago to Kansas City. My wife and I have felt, felt the Lord and said, all right, we're giving up everything. We left everything and moved here and joined the ministry out here for a while. And we worked as missionaries, which was never on the radar, but uh, became missionaries for eight years. Um, also, oh, wait, a, a businessman became a missionary? <laughs> businessman became a missionary, yeah. And in turn, with that, the businessman ended up helping the, mis the, the mission base there for a while, turning things around, bringing in different funding. And the Lord was clearly, you know, raising me into a whole different level of I ended up taking on events and conferences. And so the businessman all of a sudden was dealing with many different parts of ministry. And then I got involved with healing and deliverance and just all kinds of different aspects and going deeper in the word. And it was a blast. It was great. But when it was time to move on, it was time to move on. And the Lord, I stayed in Kansas City. Like this is the city that I've been planted by the Lord in. A uh, matter of fact, in January this year, uh, sorry, January 2023, I was telling somebody, yeah, I'm, you know, people are like, where do you live? I, well, I live in Kansas City, but I'm from Washington State. And it was the Lord who said, this is your city. You've been here for 10 plus years. Wow. I'm like, 
oh wow yeah so i'm from kansas city now like <laughs> I, I say it and i and i mean it is you know i root for the chiefs i, I don't root against them so I, i've converted at some level were you a seahawk fan before i'm still a seahawk fan so I'm, okay i i have an afc and an nfc team how's that that works <laughs> And, and you were cheering for the Seahawks when they had a lot of uh, good things going, Super Bowls yeah. and other oh, things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we had just moved here a couple of years when the Seahawks were really doing well. So, Yeah, very good. So that put us into, into the city. Um, and now the, September of last year, I ended up meeting a gentleman named Daniel Geraci, who was starting United in Crisis. And uh, so I jumped on board with him because the Lord called me to be a unifier. That's what the heart behind what I do is I help unify processes. That's 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 been my gifting for years. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be in ministry. It was more about simplifying processes across the a business world and into different chunks of areas. But but he clearly said, you know, United in Crisis Kansas City is something I'd like you to do. And I go, OK, I don't think I quite understood what I was jumping into right in the beginning. Um, but when the Lord asked me to do something, I I've learned to say yes quicker than I have thought through the process of it. So that's great. Say, saying no can have some consequences. And none of us like. Exactly. <laughs> so. I think what Jasmine was going to ask you, Greg, is something to do with um, how do you discern a calling? Like, so you're you're a businessman, you're doing what you wanted to do. You own your own business and a lumber mill, I think you said. And then all of a sudden you now you get called away to Kansas City. But how what what was that like to get a calling? And what when you just how would you describe what it means to get a calling? Uh, that is a great question. Um, for me and for my wife, actually, it was the one thing about my wife and I, we've known each other since first grade, like we're, we're very connected and, uh, we can, we go back and forth. So we make sure we both are on the same page. And for me, it's just the overwhelming, it's not a feeling. It's just, I, I know, I know without knowing. And when I bring it to my wife and she can answer like I said, hey, I think we're supposed to move to Kansas City. She's like, yes, I heard that six months ago. And so now I'm we're on board with it. And I'm like, OK, so that's pretty much how it always works in my marriage is when I think I have the right idea. I go, hey, what about this? She's like, I was waiting for the Lord to tell you. Wow. So that that's a lot of confirmation. She gets a lot of it first. And then I, I kind of play catch up. Um, we were here visiting at the time, the International House Prayer. We were here doing uh, a mercy, And the Lord was just clearly saying you're coming here. And it wasn't an internal audible voice. It was just this overwhelming knowing. I just knew this is where I needed to come. And so it was interesting because of the way the Lord works with me. It's when, when it's time to change what I was doing, he just stops. It just, it's over. So when I went back to Washington, um, that was August, we were here visiting in 2012. And by December of that year, my business had pretty much stopped. Wow. At Christmas, the day before Christmas Eve, everything shut down. Wow. And that's a big story, but it was like, and my wife was super great because instead of, you know, that moment you could feel like a failure, my wife's like, you knew this was coming because the Lord told us. And I go, yep. Exactly. And so this the strength to lean into him and go, okay, this is going to be a ride. Here we go. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, God prepared you ahead of time, sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned something that hap has happened to me, too. When I made one of the bigger moves of my life, I wanted to tell my wife and I, I went up to tell her I, I, I was downstairs praying and I thought I need to I need to let her in on this. I go up there and I tell her she goes, yeah, I know. God already told me I was just waiting for you to <laughs> I was just waiting for you to to come up with that yourself. So that's uh that's wild how God does that. Yeah, it's it's it, it's super helpful to make you feel like. All right, we're on the same page. Yeah. When you think about United in Crisis coming to Kansas City, can you give us like your, what's your vision for the for the future or a hope? I'm sure it's probably still forming, but what, what does it look like to, to bring United in Crisis to Kansas City? So 
the 30,000 foot level of United in Crisis, Kansas City, of course, we want to build a Christ centered uh, church network across the city that's partnered with churches, businesses, individuals. They work together and we want to train and equip the church so they can respond to emotional, spiritual, and physical needs in our community. Right now, you know, we, United in Crisis was birthed out of the Austin Disaster Relief Network. And Austin Disaster Relief Network was made and created in the middle of crisis. They were having full hurricanes, a couple of them in a row, and the churches realized they needed to come together. And Daniel Geraci, who is the founder of the Austin Disaster Relief Network, helped build for the last 14, 15 years that whole network down there, the systems in place that really have unified the body of Christ to, re to respond in those crises. So he kind of, at the end of the year, he felt the calling to leave that and come and start the United in Crisis, the actual national moment, because he sees other cities that need to be prepared for crisis. And in Kansas City, I, I'm i good. I'm good. Let's build it for major crisis. But 25 plus years, the city itself hasn't seen a major crisis. Yeah. And so I'm coming in with the language of, hey, we want to prepare for the, the you know, the F5 tornado. It, it's, it's truly what we want to do. But I want to come in with a much more of, hey, how do we relationally connect with the churches to actually help the body of Christ locally to come and be the good Samaritans for your community, to actually come and help the, your local community when their house fires or, you know, their frozen pipes, the little things that are people cause crisis in people's day every, you know, in their lives every day. We really want to teach the church how to respond to the to crisis that are already happening today in the community. So we. So our hope is to be the ones who can help increase the love of Jesus through serving, serving their communities, putting the church back in the right place. Because today, anytime a crisis happens, everybody goes, how's the government going to help me? And that's not the right answer. And most of the time when a crisis happens in anyone's lives, they immediately put God on trial. Like, why would this happen to me? So instead of us coming in and, and, and you know, preaching to them, we want to come in and just love on them and walk them through and make sure that the church is the hero with Jesus in their life, in their crisis. That's our that's my heart is so the church can respond rightly. It can be the Good Samaritan to come and pick them up, help them, fund them, feed them, bandage them, walk them all the way back to where they're back into a community of Christian believers and their hearts, their hearts are back on fire and instead of their house on fire. That's a whole lot I know in a short amount of time. So I think what Jasmine was saying, Greg, is if someone doesn't know the Austin story, can you tell that story? It's a pretty inspiring story of the way the church dived in during yeah. the, middle, in the middle of an ice storm. I think it was. It was. It was. So when the Austin Disaster Relief Network started 15 years ago, they had had two major hurricanes. So the city had been pummeled. And here come a major ice storm. And so I know Daniel started to bring together the churches to respond to the individual, you know, to individual needs, to the massive need of power outages. And, you know, Austin doesn't get a whole lot of cold weather. And so the fact that an ice storm came and pretty much shut everything down, um, it was pretty traumatic at the time, but the church responded. And that's the thing. The systems were, the Lord downloaded a plan to, day, to Daniel, which was super impressive. Like, I, I see what he's built, and I'm like, only the Lord could have done it. It truly is a network of organization of organizational businesses and churches coming together to actually help the community. And the beauty of the network, what it did is it trained individuals how to respond to the crisis. Instead of, you know, one of the things that I, 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 I've learned about people is they always want to respond but sometimes they don't have the right language. They don't know what to do. And so that's what Austin did, the, the Austin Disaster Relief Network. It actually brought, you know, training for shepherding, crisis intervention, trauma training, all the ways that we could help people along the way in, in the midst of wherever they're at in that storm. And so it was birthed out of crisis. It was like the, the government couldn't take anymore. You know, that's that's the thing I think where people always assume the government can help you. The government's designed to run daily. And and 
the church is actually what was supposed to come and actually help people in the middle of their crisis. I mean, hundred plus years ago, the church ran every major organization that that actually was involved with foster care, crisis prevention, those kind of things. It was the church's responsibility. Somewhere in the early 1900s, the government ended up getting their hand in it. And we as a church, we kind of gave it over to them. And so we're hoping, and I and I see the system work in Austin. I want to bring that same system here and be, have the church become the answer again. Yeah, that's beautiful. I remember when I met with Daniel a couple of different times, and he was telling the story of how that um, the first morning when the ice was everywhere, the government was just completely incapacitated. Right. But the church was able to to mobilize an a uh, army or a fleet of pickup trucks and uh, pickup trucks from the church network. I think it was Christ Together and some other networks uh, went out all over the city doing good. Uh, taking food to people, rescuing people who are stranded, helping people in a variety of ways. And while the while the city basically was paralyzed, uh, the church was at work. Yeah, and the church. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he gathered, I think he says somewhere around 200 four by fours in a couple hours. You know, yeah. one thing about Texans, they have four by fours. So yes. they could throw and they could take stuff everywhere. They threw in four wheel drive and went and delivered food and water and all kinds of services, blankets, portable heaters, everything. That So they be, did become the answer because yeah. you're right. The government was kind of like hand strung at the time. Yeah. Reminded me of the story I saw, you know, back from World War II, I think it was, where the in the English went and sent like this uh, convoy fleet of ships, you know, like they were little sails, sailboats and other kinds of things over to rescue stranded uh, English uh, soldiers, and uh, and you know the it was a little person, the common person, the everyday person who made the big difference because they all combined their efforts to do something none of us could, none of them could do alone. And when I think about United in Crisis, I think about a similar kind of thing. Like the crisis could be a big thing, uh, but it, I mean it might be the apartment down the street from the church catches on fire and burns, and then the the church mobilizes their people to help people who get displaced because of the fire. You know, it doesn't have to be something huge. It could be, it could be, I mean, it's huge to the people that are involved, but it doesn't have to be citywide. It could be, it could be re regionally inside of a, a neighborhood. Absolutely. So when we are talking about building the network in Kansas city, we're breaking it into 12, 13 different sectors. And so each sector is going to have a sector leader that actually helps distribute or Let's everybody know what's going on in their community in there. So the local churches will go under a sector leader who will then use care portal is the actual uh, means of getting the information to the local churches and then the sector leader. And so sector leader will say, hey, this crisis is going on. You there's eight churches in this in this network right here in this community which ones can help or who wants to respond or whatever that is or what part of it do you want to take on? Because part of it is, yeah, the, the initial crisis, but it's actually walking the family through the trauma, helping them through, you know, food, water, all that. And then if they don't have insurance, who's going to help them walk through the process of getting into a new place and then but shepherding them hearts all the way back into you know, hopefully restoring them into a, a church somewhere, too. So I don't know if it's so much concern. I think it's more of a mindset that I see. And it's, it's the local church mind. And it's. It's it's fair. I understand it. But a lot of what I hear when I have conversations with pastors and other leaders of churches, they're like, oh, they're very careful of the time for their their people. And they're very concerned that, you know, I can't even get my church to serve on Sunday and then turn around and tell them they're going to do all this other thing. It's like, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. But what I find more times than not, when you walk into a local church and you you have a choice to serve. You can be an usher. You can be a greeter. You can run sound. If you don't play an instrument, um, or you maybe the work, whatever. The, all the jobs are within the walls, and that doesn't touch the heart of all the congregation. And so, when we come alongside and they join the network, we come in and actually give training to actually take that outside the walls. And when here's the thing that I'm trying to get pastors to understand: when your people actually get trained. 
and actually have this mission mindset to go after their community, they become much better volunteers within your church. They become people who actually want to serve local missions, out, outreach missions, because they've never had language or training of it. And the other thing I want to tell pastors is we don't want your any more of your time. I understand pastors are overloaded. Like they have a full schedule Sunday through Saturday, just trying to keep their flock, you know, all the issues that go on with the flock. But I'm saying if we don't want you to have to worry about that, we're going to bring the training. You're going to appoint somebody within your church who's going to be a crisis coordinator, one who's going to help facilitate it, one or two people. And then the rest of it falls on that person or those couple of people with us. And yeah. we want to bring the training, the supplies. We're not we're not trying to be a burden. We're actually going to create a helper, a better help network within your community, within your congregation. And it's proven. I mean, too many pastors in the system of Austin that'll come and tell you, my church body is so much more involved than they used to be. Because one of the things that they just don't have, they don't have the language, they don't have an understanding. They want to help, but nobody's ever told them how to help. And so they, you know, that, like being the hands and feet of Jesus. It's it's a hundred percent of what we desire is to be the hands and feet, to be the good Samaritan, you know. Yeah. It, it, that's what God calls us to be is the good Samaritan. He says that's good. And so that's what our heart is. If we can train the church to be that good Samaritan. I remember talking to Daniel when he was in town, we had two different uh, coffees. And then you and I had a talk at, we had a coffee at Panera, I think it was. And we, we were talking about how the, what we're trying to do with Love KC, where we are helping people, motivating, equipping uh, them to be loving their neighbors goes hand in hand with what you're doing in terms of helping them to be able to respond to a need in the area. And many times what we're seeing is, you know, the two great commandments are to love God and love your neighbor. And so people have something they've identified probably that they want to do to love God. And they're probably trying to grow in that. If you ask the common Christian, they can tell you, what are you doing to grow? They'll say, they can name two or three things. Oh, I'm doing these things to grow my relationship with God. But if we ask them, well, what are you doing to grow your uh, relationship to your neighbors? Like, what are you doing that to love your neighbors? Second, second commandment. A lot of times they'd look at you like uh, keeping my lawn mowed, yeah. <laughs> making yeah. sure my dog doesn't do his business in your yard. You know, they like they they don't have a real big plan usually for that. Maybe um, if they want to really step out, they might shovel someone else's sidewalk or something or their their um, driveway. But uh, what we've come alongside to do is say, hey, you can pray for your neighbors. That's a great place to start. If you pray, be careful, because God's probably going to ask you to do something. And uh, as you pray, you're going to get ideas that come from the Holy Spirit. When you act on those, someone's probably going to ask you why. And then you have a chance to tell your story. And uh, it can lead to them actually making spiritual progress. And we, what we see is when this happens with people throughout a congregation, the whole congregation catches, catches the fire. And so I totally believe what you're saying. Like if you, if you can get the everyday person to know they are called, they are gifted, they are chosen, and that God has something for them where they live, learn, work, and play, and if they can help them to find it, then uh, their spiritual life takes off. So from the first time I met with Daniel and talked with you, I always felt like there was a synergy between what we're trying to do and what you're trying to do. And we we have these 4,200 lights, we call them, people who've accepted the responsibility for their neighborhood. I would love to see these lights, you know, become a part of the United in Crisis Network and be be ready to serve the needs of, of their neighbors. Yeah, I... I would love that. So how do you join? I guess that's probably the, the right. real question. So you can go to our website, United in Crisis. It's UICKC.org, United in Crisis, Kansas City. And then from there, there's three different places you can go. You can volunteer just as a direct volunteer. You can, have, you know, if you're if you're a pastor or have a agreement with your pastor, you can sign your church up. If you have a business, there's a business part of the network. There's three different ways to join the network. 
And once you join, you're going to do a basic orientation. And from there, we'll just keep walking you out, which trainings are grabbing your heart, whatever you feel the Lord calling you to, because there's several different ways you can serve on this, either for the main team in your church community. There's, there's an, there's never not enough. There's never enough volunteers and there's a tons of roles for people. So. Craig, I would like to ask, um, even with the volunteer stuff, um, what is something that you would like to share to the listeners that are listening about even United in crisis? What's something you would like to share? Something that we didn't bring up that you would like to share that's on your heart? Um, We'd love to know if there's anything. You know, we're a 501c3. We're we're just you know we launched in October. We are planning our flag one April. We open up our call and command center. We're going live with our network. We have our software in place. We have everything going. It's, we are partnering with Vision Link, which is a a great software company that's going to start opening it up to to match into Care Portal, so we can actually begin to respond to crisis. We've got you know, five, six churches on the network already. We have over 120 volunteers who have already been trained, you know, even in the midst of the holidays, the cold weather, and now coming into Easter, you know, we do have some, you know, a few churches jumped on. We have a lot more that are talking about it. I I just want to encourage people that if you feel called to this, if you feel this pulling on your heartstring in partnership and being a volunteer, whatever that is, we accept, we say yes to you. Um, you know, we're we're a great organization that is built 100 percent on volunteers. I myself is the number one volunteer, uh, a lot of hours. And so we're not asking for you to do anything that the Lord's not asking you to do. But we, we need funding and we need people. And so whichever side of that that you feel called to or both, we're, we'd love to have you be a part of us. That's great, Greg. What a. What is the contact info? You you mentioned a couple things earlier, but can you give like your email or your phone number? Or if someone wanted to reach out to you, how would they do that? So you can email me directly, greg at uickc.org. Go to the website, uickc.org. There's an info button there, an email contact. You can email us there or you can call me. My number is still a Washington number. I've had it for a year. <laughs> It's 360-942-7635. I'm, if I can't answer, I'll call you back, shoot me a text, whatever. I'd love to have as many conversations as anybody wants to have about it. Uh, thank you, Greg. And we'll put a lot of these in the notes too. So if you're looking, if you're watching later on YouTube or you're looking at the uh, Love KC Living on Mission, there's always a note section. And so you can find the contact information there. So, Greg, thanks so much. I I was inspired by the meetings with Daniel and with you personally, and I really I just feel inspired again as I listen to what you're saying. I think that the thing that sticks in my mind is we all have different callings and giftings. And so many times the church has really honored a pastoral gift, you know, mm-hmm. the, teaching, the teaching gift. Or uh, maybe valued the gift of generosity where people give. <laughs> But uh, sometimes there's a, there's like 25 other gifts that don't get as much attention. I think how that God called the the guys who created the temple, like he gifted them for craftsmanship. And they, they, they did the work on the temple. And I think there are people that are gifted to be craftsmen today. And they can build things or they can repair things or they, you know, they can use their trucks like they did in Austin. There's really something anybody can do. And um, that's that's what I see you guys doing is just making it easy for anybody to get involved and just essentially be ready for the kinds of things that uh, that could happen. Yeah, I, I agree, Gary. And there's I want to share this. If you're an administration person, that is a gift from God. <laughs> Every organization needs it. So just don't, call, don't call matter. Jasmine because we've got we've got her. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm asking for other than Jasmine at this. Other point. than Jasmine. <laughs> and if you feel led to, like you know, we have operations team. When you really start digging down to where we're going, we got hand radio, we got operation team, we got field ops, we got you know. And so if you feel called to any part of it, please reach out. 
Because yeah, so I promise good. you, we don't have the spot yet. Three months from now, we will. That's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we in our in our own neighborhood, we had a bunch of neighbors standing outside the um, a house. Several it was, it was about three houses down from ours, and um, they were visiting, talking in the driveway, and they heard this loud crash. And what happened is the there was one of the neighbors was working on his deck and he was doing some work underneath the deck and somehow the whole deck fell on top of him. <sighs> and of course, this, know. you know, it's potentially life threatening. So they, they run back there and the deck has him pinned. Actually his head was pinned against ground. And so um, quickly they ran and got jacks from uh, their trucks. They had trucks and they were able to get the, the deck race enough to get him out from underneath that. And by then the ambulance got there too. So they could, you know, they could uh, put his neck in one of those braces. And then as they started to bring him up to the ambulance, the wife wanted to go, but she also had three children and one of them was a baby. And so the neighbors like came over and, and uh, took the baby out of her arms and took another one, took the kids to their house and, the mom got in the in the ambulance and a and a friend who wanted to ride with her to comfort her, and so she got in the ambulance too, and uh, they took off and went to the went to the hospital. To make a long story short, um, the guy made a full recovery over time, but I'll never forget how these group of neighbors sprung into action, and uh, they were they were ready, and um, they didn't know like they didn't have the preparation that you're going to provide to people, but they did what they knew to do in the moment. And I just feel like everybody can do that. Like everybody can can be prepared to lend a hand, whether it's taking the baby, you know, from the mom and watching the baby or babysitting the kids or jumping in the ambulance to ride up there or using your jack. You know, there's something everybody can do. And I think that's what I hear you saying is let's get let's get the body of Christ ready to serve. And then whatever comes, we're we're prepared. Yeah, I agree. That's exactly what we're saying, Gary. It's, you know, in the moment. I, I watch people come, they flock. When crisis hits, people come. They want to be a part. They want to help. And instead of coming just with the casserole dish or coming with, yeah. the, you know, hey, I just want to be a body. It's we, if you have the opportunity to put a foundation of training behind you to give you the right, you know, structure of what you're looking for. Like, this is it. And I I mean, the Lord has been using crisis for generations to unify the body of Christ. And we right. seem to leave it and he can bring it back. And we're going to go. We seem to do this cycle. But in like in Kansas City, I, I just feel like this is this city is ready to, to right. unify. There are so many good groups already who have like yourself, I mean, that are already working together in certain ways. So it's like, how do we really network it all to be the hands and feet for the city, the greater Kansas City area, because we're talking over two million people total. Right. Well, and I think I so, told you. I think it's for such a time as this that you're here. So. Yeah, I don't think the timing's by mistake. So that that's one thing the Lord likes to do is His perfect timing. So. Right. Yeah, He's He's ahead of the game. He's always preparing us ahead of time if we're li- if we're listening. Absolutely. Well, if you've been listening today, thanks for joining in on the Blessed Podcast. And thank you so much for uh, your faithfulness over time. I do encourage you, if you haven't subscribed, to go ahead and subscribe so that every time one comes out, then uh, you're notified. And I would also encourage you, if you hear something that's meaningful to you, then pass it on. So um, you can find these podcasts. Again, if you're new, this is the first time you're listening, you can find them at Love KC Living on Mission. That's our Facebook group. And that's a group where anybody can post. It's meant to be a community of people helping each other live on mission. And then you can also find them on our Love KC Today page. It's a YouTube channel. And you can find them on Apple and on Google Play and over a variety of other formats. So thank you so much from whatever uh, platform you've joined. We're doing this together. We Our word that we always say is let's join Jesus where he's already at work. So God's at work somewhere in your neighborhood. So see where he is at work and and join him. This is Gary Kendall uh, speaking for Greg Topping. Thank you for being our guest today, Greg. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you, Jasmine, for your contributions. Always glad I can always help. Yeah. And so let's, until we meet again, go find Jesus, watch what he's doing and join him there. That's it for this episode of the Blessed Podcast. 
We hope this podcast informed and encouraged you. Remember to subscribe on your favorite format, iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube. If you want to see the interview on Zoom, hop over to our Love KC Living on Mission Facebook group. Have a blessed day.